I wanted to put together a video that I wish I could have seen when I was finally investing in a full set of full frame lenses. I'm going to cram in tons of examples that you can get with each different lens from gimbal work to handheld work. Yes, this shot is handheld. All of the footage you're seeing today will be graded and my opinions will be rather anecdotal as we're not gonna be doing any pixel peeping comparisons in this specific video. Hey friend, Levi here. Today I wanna to talk about the best lenses for full frame video on the Sony system. And I think my answers are gonna surprise you because I don't actually think it's a requirement to go the G Master route with all the lenses that you choose. So I'm gonna talk through four lens options that I'm really happy with today, and one of them that I kind of regret buying. So if you forced me to only pick two lenses to go with or two lenses to start with, I think the very first lens I would get would be the 24 to 105 because it checks the documentary filmmaker box and content creator box. And then the 20 millimeter 1.8 as well. If those are just the two lenses that I absolutely am thrilled with. So what do I even mean by best lenses for video on full frame? Well, that comes down to what my specific needs are. So there's three categories that were really important to me when I built up this kit. For specific jobs, this actually wouldn't be the best kit for video. And specifically with client work and some of the documentary stuff I do, I actually vastly prefer manual lenses where I get control over a nice smooth focus throw. I've got a nice big monitor, I can see the image, I can see if it's in focus and I've got full control. But these days, a big part of what I'm doing is content creation. So things like YouTube here, I need a set of lenses that can perform well with the autofocus capabilities that we get in these cameras. This is my biggest pain point with shooting with my GH5 system, where autofocus, it was sketchy as can be. So that was the big reasoning behind narrowing down my focus to native mount lenses. I did not wanna do adapters and stuff for my personal kit because Let's just be honest here, if you're using adapters, the amount of lenses that are available and the different styles of image that you can get, it's just, it's just endless. So specifically here, I'm talking about native mount lenses that I think are great for video. And when you search up lenses, which one's the most sharp, which one's the most this, that doesn't always factor in what does the usability of that lens feel like when you go to shoot with it. So a lot of the G Master lenses that are available don't actually have internal stabilization in the lens itself. And that's actually really important to me as a filmer because so much of what I do now with my documentary filmmaking is handheld. I used to take a monopod with me everywhere I went so that way I could get nice stable footage that didn't have that DSLR style shake. But now that we've got stabilized sensors, whew, I'm fired up on that, a full frame stabilized sensor with stabilized lenses, those two together create a handheld system that frankly, I don't like shooting without these days anymore. I'll start with my absolute favorite purchase lens so far, the best bang for your buck, I think, for what I'm getting out of it, and that is the 20 millimeter 1.8. It's not the G Master, it's not the 24 1.4. Nope, it's just a 1.8 and uh, it's a 20 millimeter. Okay, now this here is a great example of kind of a bread and butter shot for me as a content creator. It's just the talking headshot straight to the camera. And uh, it, it's tight in my production van where I end up filming a lot of these. And so getting the camera far away from me is not always an option. Like I can just reach out and touch the lens here. And what I found was 24 millimeters is just a little bit too tight in here to get a shot wide enough where I can crop in and out of it to get rid of my, uh, my, my little ums and ahs as I'm talking and just make the, the video flow in the edit. The build quality of this lens is great. To me, it almost seems imperceptible from that of the G Master variants. It's really lightweight and the autofocus works fantastic. Here, I'm gonna walk towards the lens and just watch how effortlessly it tracks in on me without any rapid pulsing or anything like that. Weight wise, it's very similar to that of my 55 millimeter prime. So when I'm doing gimbal work for client stuff, I can often just swap in between the two lenses without doing a full rebalance, which makes it really easy for getting lots of coverage. But I honestly hardly ever shoot gimbal stuff these days unless it's kind of more the corporate route or a specialty thing. I do so much handheld work. 
For those familiar with how I shot with my GH5 in the past, the 12 mm 1.4 basically lived on that camera so often for me. And this 20 mm is kind of the direct replacement for how I then shoot on the A7S. And so it's important to note that when I go from standard in-body stabilization to active stabilization, there's a digital crop. So it actually makes the lens end up behaving closer to what you'd be familiar with with a 24 millimeter. That's again, another big reason why I like that extra bit of width to the frame because I'm so often shooting my handheld stuff at 20 millimeters with active stabilization. And my not so secret secret about editing 4K video is that I'm very willing in a 4K timeline to scale clips up to 150% and beyond to get a tighter shot, even up to 180, 200%. And the reality is once it gets exported out to web video, the resolution holds up just fine. And only the most persnickety of pixel peeping type people will notice that I did that. And to me, that's totally fine. I'll talk about the various stabilization modes and comparisons deeper in this video in regards to different lens setups and whatnot. But something that's really cool is that you can turn stabilization off altogether and then use Catalyst Browse to analyze the gyroscopic data from the camera and do a post stabilization. The 20 mil works fantastic for this, again, because the extra wide frame and the results just kind of seem like magic. It's kind of incredible how good it works. And these were all just shot handheld with me on my one wheel and the before and afters, the shake difference is just kind of crazy. It's wide enough that I can just grab my camera without the need of a switch pot or like, you know, a gorilla pot or something like that to get it really out there so you can fit yourself in frame. You can just hold the camera right next to you. It's nice and light. A 16 to 35 F 2.8 isn't necessarily gonna get you a look like this. Uh, so that's why uh, running the prime for that wide shot has got a special place in my heart. Moving right along, let's talk about my next all time favorite lens for the way that I'm shooting. And that is gonna be the 24 to 105 F4, optically stabilized. This is just a classic focal length in the full frame world. This is what I used when I was shooting on 5D rentals back in the day. And the reason for this is that this coverage it's hard to argue with how helpful it is when you're trying to just film things fast. It's not always the case where swapping between my lenses is easy. So if I can show up at a location filming dock work, filming client work, I can get my wide shots and then immediately punch into 105 and get a lot of those tighter frames. That to me is just massively beneficial for a quickly moving system. The performance out of this lens, I think most people would be concerned if they're going, they just think, you know, I need depth of field, I need depth of field. But when you get into these deeper ranges on the lens, 50 and beyond, at F4, you're, you're still getting depth of field. I hope you can tell that I really like this lens and that I'm trying to make a case for it. I just think it's a really good value, both from a price standpoint and a weight standpoint. And when you throw it on your camera, you can get your wides and your telephotos with the same lens. There's this interesting obsession with those just starting out that every single zoom lens has to be the widest aperture possible. And in my experience, especially with zoom lenses, that just isn't the case. Take the 24 to 70 G Master for instance. That lens is f2.8 and over twice the cost of the 24 to 105. And I would argue it's actually at a disadvantage in some ways for video because it doesn't have internal lens stabilization. And doing my tests between these two lenses, I was very happy with the performance of the 24 to 105. The 24 to 70 is definitely going to do better on stills, but again, stills is not my priority. I would much rather have the slightly extended telephoto reach of the 105 and internal lens stabilization. Another benefit about the lens being so light is that if I use it on a gimbal, I can zoom the lens in and get some tight shots without rebalancing, and the motors on the RS2 can keep up with it as long as I'm not moving too aggressively. We just used this setup recently on a helicopter shoot we were doing for a client, and we filmed a whole behind the scenes of it that's going to be available on the Atomist channel. The footage, this is just a tease, the footage is so good. So this is the 70 to 200 that Nick has. This is a 2.8. This is an absolutely gorgeous lens and arguably I should have it in my kit. Investing in this one, how much is this? This is thousands of dollars Canadian. 
Like three grand. This is close to three grand Canadian. So this is a, a specialty lens. The the photos that you can get with this, the stuff that Nick shoots with this is just stunning. And honestly, getting to that 200 mil for photography is amazing. In video, there's less times that getting to that 200 mil is super helpful for me. If I wanted super telephoto range, I might even be more inclined to go the 100 to 400 millimeter route, so that way I can really get in there. For me, if I'm running all my lenses out of one backpack, and I'm trying to make decisions about what other equipment I'm taking with me, there's a weight and size difference that's happening between these two lenses. And let me just say, I've made the mistake in the past when I've rented in full frame lenses for video shoots. Uh, I just, I tend to go, we're renting. Let's just get the lowest aperture. Let's get the best lenses. And when those F 2.8 lenses come in and they're these big chunky boys and you're trying to pack that into your bag and suddenly you're realizing you're at like a 50 pound bag and half of that is glass. Uh, it makes you start to question your life choices when you've got the, when you've got the now hike that in for several days. Uh, we've got two more lenses that we're gonna address and also some variants and some other tests coming. But uh, I wanna talk about another piece of my kit as a content creator that is uh, very helpful for getting good results because we can't just do uh, a video on lenses without acknowledging a massively important part about video, which is lighting. Learning how to film and light yourself well can definitely level up your projects. And it's often quite a bit easier than most people expect. And I actually do get questions about this setup in here and how you can achieve something like this at home quite often. And the, the biggest factor is it's not quantity of lights or those kinds of things. It's actually just controlling where the light comes from and shaping it yourself. So I encourage people to make sure that they're filming in a room that they have control over the light. So you'll often see, you know, I'm putting up my window covers. I'm not letting light come in from outside because I want to be able to tell the light to come from somewhere. And so all I've got right now is one light right here through some diffusion on my face and that's what gets us this look. And when I get questions about what lights do I use and what can I get on a budget and what do I get when I'm starting out, what can I travel with, I'm often flustered a little bit because a lot of the lighting equipment that I've invested into is for the production company. So it's this bigger, larger, more expensive systems. And so for this shot right here, I actually lit this with a nice little uh, tiny portable light that's actually brought to you by the sponsor of this video. So let me tell you about it. It's uh, from Loom Cube and they've got this little thing called a broadcast kit. And this is the Panel Go. So they've got this credit card like light, or I guess it's more like an iPhone size, but it is, it's shocking how tiny this light is. It's, it's really small and it has a built-in battery and this is the bi-color panel. So this little panel is actually what's lighting me right now. I'll tell you how I achieved that in a sec. But this little thing is sweet. And so it's USB-C rechargeable and it's geared towards just being flexible. So if you wanna run it on your camera and get some product shots or use it as a documentary light for filling in when lighting is sparse, they've got this little fold out stand where you don't need all this extra lighting grip equipment. You can just pull out this little stand, run the light off that and get it off your camera to side light an object to get some rim light going. And if you wanna jump up another level, I really like these fold out soft boxes. That's what I'm using right here. This one's called the D-Fuse. And you can put that over basically any small light and it's gonna really expand the light source. Makes your light nice and soft so you don't get those contrasty lines on your face. And then you can also take it from your Zoom setup at home at your desk and then you can go out with whatever it is that you're making with your camera. Uh, it's just a really flexible addition to your kit. Um, I'm quite impressed with these and uh, thanks Loom Cube for sponsoring this video. Check out the link down below for more Loom Cube lights and I recommend the broadcast kit. Okay, so we've covered the 20 mil and the 24 to 105 purchases that I'm very happy with. I explained my reasoning. Now let's talk through my last two lenses and uh, especially why one of them I'd swap out for a different variant to cover the same range. The 55 millimeter F 1.8. Maybe you're starting to sense a theme here with my prime lenses, f1.8. And the reason why I went with this primarily is because it's lighter and it's autofocus in video is really good. This did feel like the biggest risk out of any lens that I'd purchased for my kit so far, primarily because I'd personally had zero experience with it and I didn't know anybody else that had this lens in their kit. So I was basically just going primarily off online reviews. 
And there's a lot of 50 millimeters that are available. It's got the name Nifty 50 for a reason. It's kind of the go-to starting point lens for a lot of people. And there's some really affordable options in this range that you can get stunning images with down to like 150 bucks, you can get a 50 millimeter lens. So was it worth it going almost close to a thousand dollars for this little guy? Yes and no, but mostly yes. It is hard to understate how tiny this guy is. Just throwing this on a small camera and running around with it, it's so inconspicuous, light and fast and easy to use, it's awesome. Optically, it's stunning and the autofocus works really, really well, which this was my biggest concern with some of the other 50 millimeters that you could buy was with the larger lens elements in the F1.4 versions. I was just worried that the focus motors might be not as smooth in tracking subjects up to the camera. It is a prime lens, and that's where the in-body active stabilization on the Sony becomes really handy. It actually does a great job canceling out the handheld jitters of shooting with this handheld. Again, I used to always use a monopod for shooting with a 50, and the fact I can get these stable shots handheld with this prime is really exciting to me. Running this lens on a gimbal is really fun, and that autofocus, being able to track a subject matter while gimbling is just such a treat. The main downside of this lens is that it's close focus distance. Like it can't, like right there we're out of focus. So here, I'm trying to focus on this flower right there and it's too close to the lens. So if I back up a little bit, back up a little bit, there it is. So from me to this flower, this is how far away I have to be from an object to get it in frame and in focus. Okay, I wanna show you what the different stabilization modes look like. Right now we don't have any turned on. So you can see some of that nice handheld shake. We're gonna to go to standard. So. This is just the sensor, really smooths things out. And then we'll go up to active and you'll see it punch in. There's the punch in. So active is using some digital and it really makes it, oh, we're gonna focus shift because I'm on autofocus, nice. In my experience, good lens stabilization is superior to in-body stabilization. However, when you have both in-body and lens stabilization, they're working together in tandem for even better results. That being said, I have not had great experience using adapters to different lens mounts to get this dual image stabilization effect. Okay, the last lens, uh, and the one that I regret, and so I'd try steer you otherwise if you wanna cover this focal range, 16 to 35 F4. Uh, this is the optical steady shot version. So I opted for this over the 16 to 35 G Master because the G Master is really expensive. It's bigger, and I thought optical steady shot on this lens is gonna be more helpful than it is. Uh, truth is, optical steady shot on a really wide lens like this, just it's not that helpful if you have internal stabilization already. So I'm not getting tons of benefit from this lens trying to stabilize, in my opinion. So this lens was a compromise to try get that optical stabilization and the lighter weight. Both compromises, which turned out to actually not be that great, and my whole theory about not needing f2.8 zoom lenses kind of falls apart if you're wanting any kind of depth of field with a wide angle. So if you're unfamiliar with lenses and mechanics and the way that the focus plane works, uh, your focus plane is a lot deeper naturally on a wide angle lens. So f4 at 16 millimeters, that focus plane is gonna be much deeper than it is at 50 millimeters on a zoom lens. This is something certainly to consider if you're wanting to get any kind of background separation with your subject matter while using the 16 to 35. If you're shooting it at the wide end, you're not gonna get much background separation at all. Whereas with the 16 to 35 G Master, you do get some of that background separation and that blurry look. Now a turn off of the G Master version, again, is that it's quite expensive. So another option that I should have considered here and I'd recommend to you is the Tamron version, which a lot of people have had some really fantastic results with. I wish that I had chosen this lens over the 16 to 35 F4 that I got. 
And I know Sony just did release that super wide prime with the low aperture. I think it's a 14 millimeter, something like that. Problem with that is you're getting into a rounded front element that you can't put filters on. And for me, being able to run filters on the lens is, is kind of a make or break because uh, I'm not gonna always be putting on a big matte box when I'm out in the field. So being able to put screw on filters is really important to me. So that's why I probably wouldn't go that route myself. But man, that lens would be amazing for shooting astrophotography. This, this lens is, is not that great for astrophotography. It can sort of do it, but it's, it's not that great. So I guess in closing, if you're still watching this, if you're the kind of person who has been doing some research on lenses, or maybe you've followed my work for a little bit and you're wondering what kind of lenses I've been using, uh, if you've been in the headspace that you've got to have those 2.8 zooms, that you've got to have the most expensive version of each prime, uh, I would say you don't. Um, and no, the, the lenses that I'm shooting with aren't budget. Uh, they're still hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, some of them over a thousand dollars, like they're expensive lenses. Nick's bumping my tripod. Uh, but the thing is, is that when you're like, you don't, there's, I hope I've communicated here that there actually is some benefits to the smaller versions as well. And you're saving money. And I think in the video world, those cons that you're thinking of, it's, it's cost benefit, right? It's always the pros and cons when you're deciding what to carry with you. But if I'm upping all of my lenses to that next step up, the size gets bigger, my cost up front gets bigger, I'm losing stabilization on some of them. In summation of the kit that I've been shooting with for the last eight months, I've been really pleased with the A7S III for basically being a content creation machine and a documentary machine. Uh, it works really well. When I show up for my client work, it's doing what I'm asking of it. Uh, and also, I feel like you've been able to notice in some of the videos I've made in the last eight months, like some of them, you know, the, the production value is going up and that's opened up by a kit that the autofocus is just so dependable. The lens choices are awesome. My low light capabilities are opened wide up. Uh, especially, I think a good example of that is the one wheel video that we've been showing you some footage from. Like the low light one wheel gimbal shots with the 55 on there. Like that's just some really cool style of shooting and the autofocus worked amazing. So, is anything gonna fly away off that table? I'm scared it's gonna flip over. <laughs> that is where I'm at with my A7S III. I'm really happy with that investment. I don't review cameras on the channel very often or overview them, so I'm sorry I don't give more updates on the tech stuff. If there is tech stuff that you're interested in, we could maybe consider making some more follow-ups, but I just kind of wanted to cram that all in here at the end if you've been curious about what Levi's been using for his kit, because I know I've seen those questions and I haven't done a good job of answering them. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching and following along. We'll catch you in the next one. Uh, if you're interested in adventure filmmaking stuff, uh, certainly check out the Adventure Film Academy links below, the education stuff that we do. Uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next video. Remember, life's better when you make stuff. So